Welcome back, honors. All right, so just to give you a little bit of a change of scenery, I'm actually at my house in my guest room with a very, very, very special guest star for this flip, your second big flip, right, going into this school year. And just so I can go ahead and introduce you, his name is Rufio. He's a big baby, and he's very, very sleepy. Oh, oh. oh just look at that face. Oh, just don't you want to just like just mush that face? Oh my god, so cute. All right, anyway, so, but yeah, so I just ended up getting back from school, um, just to explain like the outfit change and stuff. Uh, but weirdly enough, spent over a half an hour recording not only yours, but also the regular West Civ flip, and it glitched out on me. So, what are you going to do, right? So, uh, i got to go ahead and record a new one, right? But where we're going today, we spent a lot of time today in class talking about uh, Mesopotamia, right? We talked about Mesopotamia, we streamlined it a little bit, talked about uh, Sumerian accomplishments, Ac the Akkadians for like two seconds, um, because that's how, about how long they were there, was two seconds. Um, we talked about them, talked about the Babylonians, right? King Hammurabi, that big uh, um, invention in, in and of itself. Uh, we talked about the Assyrians, but we kind of just dipped our toes in them for a second and hopped out because we are going to come back to them later. Um, and then we briefly talked as well about like the Neo-Babylonians and the Nebuchadnezzar story, which is just a lot of fun, you know what I mean? So, um, but now what we're getting into is the stuff that you might actually know a little bit more about, right? Oh, hey, big boy. Um, like, you might actually know like a little bit more about... Uh, this particular civilization. We're getting now into ancient Egypt, right? Which, as you can tell by the timeline right here, 3100 BC to 653 BC, that means that these guys are going to pop up in like in a straight-up civilization manner about 900 years after the establishment of Mesopotamia, all right? So we'll say 900 about 1,000 years, okay? So now remember, Mesopotamia, let's look at, so Mesopotamia, big area of land, i.e. the Fertile Crescent, the land between two rivers, right? Uh, and it's going to be home to several different city-states. Um, one is going to be a region called Sumer or Sumeria, right, which is going to have other little city-states on the inside of it. And then you're going to also have uh, Babylon, which is going to start out as a city, and it's going to expand, right? But ancient Egypt is the rival great civilization to Mesopotamia's long-standing, very intense structure. But the thing about it is, is there also could not be bigger differences between the two of them. The only true real similarity they have is they do have some kind of religious qualities that are a little bit similar, and they are both river valley civilizations, but everything else about them is wildly different, like wildly, wildly different, okay? So let's go ahead and dive into them, though, a little bit, all right? So we're going to be talking about ancient Egypt right now, okay? So let's go ahead and get after it, right? So this, of course, is the geographic home of Egypt, modern-day political Egypt anyway. All right, so where do we think that this is? Mm, I wonder if any of my little honors babies could possibly point out ancient Egypt on this map of Africa. I'll give you a second. Let's see what you got. Anybody? No? Got a second? Looking around? Still looking around? Good job, LaCour. Very impressive. That's right. Ancient Egypt is right here. Political Egypt is right here. That right there, ancient Egypt is in northern Africa, all right? So northern Africa, and it borders the Mediterranean Sea, okay? Jot that down as well, borders the Mediterranean Sea, okay? Northern Africa borders the Mediterranean. Very, very hot and arid climate when you actually think of it. When you usually think of ancient Egypt in the back of your mind, what do you see? You see Sahelian-type um, geographic traits, right? Sahelian means as in of the Sahara, right? And the Sahara Desert is the humongous. Actually, also, don't say that. That's so dumb. Don't say Sahara Desert. That's stupid, all right? So, because the word Sahara means desert, all right? So basically, when you say Sahara Desert, you're saying desert desert, all right? So say the Sahara. That was a little bit of a drop on my part. I apologize about that, right? So the Sahara is the gigantic desert that actually spans the middle of Equatorian Africa, all right? So the big thing about it is a lot of times we refer to it as the Sahel or the Sahelian zone, all right? So referring to actually the desert and hot and very close to the equator arid climate of the Sahara area, right? So the big thing about it is, is it is on the fringe of that Sahelian era, right? Area because it is very, very hot. It is very, very area. The average temperature getting up to about... 89 degrees in the summertime, right? Now, some of you are like, that's not even that bad. It's like a bajillion outside in Louisiana. But remember, a lot of that has to do with the humidity, right? And the highs in Egypt can get very, very high. And then the lows are crushingly low at night because that is actually one of the geographic tendencies of that temperature flux 
in a lot of desert climates, right? Now, some of you are like, well, there's a little bit of a similarity, right? Mesopotamia was hot and arid. It had little to no timber resources. It didn't have a lot of minerals inside of blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but this is true, but you're going to see a major difference here in a second, right? So when, as we get to it, because there's a big difference in kind of how the river plays its effects into this particular civilization by comparison to Mesopotamia. And the big stuff we're going to talk about today when we're comparing Egypt to Mesopotamia is we're going to be talking about particularly Egypt as a unit, okay, considering their government. We're going to talk about Egyptian religion a little bit more in depth than we did uh, Mesopotamia because in Mesopotamia they got 3,600 gods, you know what I mean? We can't talk about all of those guys, but we can talk about the loose construct that is Egyptian uh, mythology a little bit, right? Could talk about a couple of the key gods, which is really, really cool. And before we like go diving headfirst and all that stuff, uh, the other big thing that we can talk about is, of course, their geography, right? So we've got geography, religion, and also their government. Those are going to be the big three things we're comparing to today. And then in class, we'll be able to talk about like their time periods, chronology, because we actually know a little bit more about them because they were a continuous timeline of a civilization, right? So the big thing going forward, though, is the key river, right? Okay, so we know that the Tigris and the Euphrates are the key rivers for Mesopotamia, right? That land between two rivers, the Fertile Crescent area, yeah? So the Tigris and the Euphrates going through most of present-day Iraq and dumping out into the Persian Gulf, right? Actually dumping out into the Persian Gulf and uh, being the, the really big life providers for that area. Now, it's a big difference, though, okay? Because the Nile is going to be the life-providing source for the Egyptians, all right? Now, cool couple of little things about the Nile, just to go ahead and get you into perspective. Uh, the Nile is actually one of the only, is the only major river in the entire world that actually flows or south to north, right? Dumping out into the Mediterranean Ocean, or not Mediterranean Ocean, ugh, Mediterranean Sea, right? Now, the Nile is their key to survival, okay? And the big reason, like, looking at this, we talked about Mesopotamian religion today in class, right? And we talked about how the flood myths, as well as Mesopotamian religion in general, we got a lot of vengeful, very spiteful, very extreme gods, right? And they look upon their river as a destructive force, right? Something that might actually show up and just completely wipe out a civilization in and of itself if the gods can be vengeful, right? So that was the Mesopotamian vibe, that fear factor about your uh, river. The Egyptians, on the other hand, they did not look upon their like, river with fear. They looked upon it as the life-giving source, right? And a lot of it has to do with the seasonality of the river, right? But let's take a like, step back real quick, speaking of the Nile. Here that bad boy is. That right there is the Nile River Delta, right? When this, of course, being the Mesopotamian, or not the Mesopotamian, the Mediterranean Sea. Of course, we have the Red Sea right here, right? The word on the street is that Moses went over there and just went, right? And split that bad boy down the middle. Uh... Yeah, we'll get into the Exodus stuff later on. Apparently that there's no, like, historical evidence that the Exodus actually happened. But we'll talk about that later on, and uh, we'll get into it. Like, uh, maybe, you know, spitball some ideas on Mr. Thurn, see what he knows about that stuff. Um, but going further with it, look at this satellite image of the Nile River, right? The Nile River is just full of and teeming with life, right? We're talking about life beyond recognition, life beyond measure. Look at the amount of green that just surrounds the entire river. And it's right smack in the middle of the rest of this desert. Yeah? So you can see why the Egyptians would love to call this place home. And of course, their capital city being right about here. And it's not Cairo. I know one of y'all was going to be like, oh, it's Cairo. I know that. No, their capital city was actually Memphis. All right? Memphis. And some of y'all are probably immediately saying, I got cousins that live in Memphis. Well, no, those are that's Tennessee Memphis. We're talking about Memphis in ancient Egypt, right? Their home capital. Okay? So we'll get into the capital city thing here in a minute and talk about how their government structure was much more different from Mesopotamia. But let's start with a river. All right? So the big thing about ancient Egyptians is they depended on the Nile in a much different way than the Mesopotamians depended on the Tigris and the Euphrates. Now, the Tigris and the Euphrates, of course, over hundreds of years of flooding, had built up those really, really big natural embankments called natural levees, right? And, of course, this was connected a lot to the massive amounts of flooding that that region saw, of course, following the Pleistocene epoch when a lot of these glaciers started to melt. And then we, that's where we talked about, like, Noah and Gilgamesh having that great flood similarity, right? A lot of these religions tend to line up, right? So, and they have a lot of similar... Uh, stories that actually get transferred from religion to religion, all right? The flood being a big one, right? And flooding being a huge theme that kind of traverses its way through a lot of these different early river valley civilizations, right? Now, anyway, so speaking of getting back into it, right? Ancient Egyptians depended on the Nile 
in a much, much different fashion than the Mesopotamians feared theirs, right? And a lot of it has to do with the seasonality of it, okay? Because in every September, the Nile floods like clockwork, right? Following the rainy season in northern Africa, the se every September, the Nile would breach its banks, right? And it would just go whoop, and it would flood all the way up the riverbanks, kind of like a tide in a way, right? So, and then every single November, whoop, those floodwaters would recede, right? So and when those floodwaters receded, it's not necessarily about watering those fields. It's all about the stuff that it left behind. All right, so remember, we talked about how the Mesopotamians had to devise irrigation systems, right? So their crops would not be immediately destroyed by floods when they did or did not happen, right? Again, that vengeful, spiteful floods coming through, bat, bat, our crops are destroyed kind of thing. The Egyptians looked at this differently, mainly because of the life-giving stuff that this, these floods left behind. When the floodwaters would recede every single November in ancient Egypt, they would leave behind this gunk, right? This stuff called silt, all right, S-I-L-T, silt. Silt is tiny bits of rock and dirt and decomposed organic matter, all right, and it all comes from the bottom of a riverbed, right? Every single time something dies in a river, it sinks to the bottom of the riverbed. Every single time vegetation sinks to the bottom of the riverbed, right? And all the bottoms of the riverbeds are covered with this very, very fine material known as silt, right? And it is very, very rich as a fertilizer okay so when this stuff would be left behind because the rainy season would come and the brick the, the the bridge uh the river would breach the banks and because the floodwaters were churning up so much at the bottom of this river the floodwaters would go up and then the silt would sink down and it would actually literally fertilize all the fields for the egyptians right it re-energized their soil for them making farming extremely easy Right? Farming can be very chaotic in Mesopotamia and in the Fertile Crescent due to like the seasonality of their flooding and also sometimes it's unpredictability, right? Whereas in every September, every single time, the Nile would flood and leave behind this stuff that's as good as gold. A lot of you have probably encountered silt in your entire in your lifetime at some point or another, due to the fact that if you ever stuck your hand down into the bottom of a river before, if you've ever actually been swimming in a river before, like, I mean, growing up in the South, I know I did when I was younger, you stick your hand down in the bottom of a river bed and you pull your hand up, the dirt is so fine that every single time, right as you get to the water's edge at the top, it just, and it just comes right off the top of your hands, right? So that is this stuff right here, silt. And that stuff is full of nutrients from decomposing plant, and, excuse me, decomposing plant and organic matter right? So this stuff would re-energize their soul because this is not what you want, right? This is what the South to this day in the United States deals with because they don't have that silt-like flooding. This right here, this is the South following, this is the American South. I'm trying to show you the difference between good soul, which look how dark and brown and rich it is, and this is bad soil. This picture is actually taken from, I believe, Georgia. And this is what bad soil looks like that doesn't have those nutrients in it from years and years and years and years and years of cotton farming, right? So like cotton farming and not using crop rotation systems will suck the nutrients out of the soil and leave you with nothing but clay, right? So, and this is actually what is left behind if you don't have fertilizer to re-energize your soul. But tcha, that's the big thing though, is the Egyptians did have it, right? The Egyptians had it and they could depend on it every single year. You don't need to write this down, but you do need to kind of understand what I'm getting at here, okay? So the very first historian that most Western civilizations has ever met is this guy by the name of Herodotus, right? Herodotus hmm, is the most famous and very, very preeminent Greek historian, right, who recorded accounts of all types of different things, including the Peloponnesian War, but also Greece's relations with ancient Egypt, because they actually existed at the same time. A lot of people think that, like, oh, it must have went Mesopotamia, and then they stop, and then Egypt, and then they stop, and then Greece, and then they stop, and then nah, 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 nah. No, it's not an order thing. There's some overlap there, right? If we were to make a big timeline of these ancient civilizations, they would all kind of have these little overlap areas, right? Mesopotamia is actually one of the biggest ones, too, because of all the different kingdoms that existed in that area. But Herodotus actually did a lot of really cool historic reporting on ancient Egypt and Greece's dealings with them, right? So in this entire scheme, he told us what we know about ancient Egypt from the Greek perspective, right? Egypt is to which the Greeks go in their ships is an acquired country, something known as the gift of the Nile, right? Herodotus also said at present, it must be confessed, they obtain the fruits of their field as in their vegetables or their farmed goods of the field with less trouble than any other people in the world. 
All right, so check this out. What he's trying to say is that it is so easy to farm in Egypt because of this reinvigorated soil, this silt, and this easeability of crop management, right? Because you could just take a seed and shove it in the ground, and it's going to grow, right? It is much easier for them to farm, hence why they consider themselves the gift of that Nile, right? And they're going to base a lot of different stuff around it. A lot of their myth, mythology is going to be based around it as well. But that's a really cool little thing, a little introspective idea into their understanding of their geography. So we're actually looking back. We know their geography now, right? They're in northern Africa. They're on the borders of the Mediterranean Sea. They love the Nile River. It is very seasonal, easy to track. The floodwaters is something they depend on, etc., etc., etc. Right? So now, anyway, early on, though, Egypt early on, when they're just starting to become a civilization, they are divided into two kingdoms. And some of you are like, I thought you said they were different from Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia had like Sumer and Babylon and the Akkadia and Assyria, and then they had Neo-Babylon, and those were all these other different kingdoms. How is Egypt any different? Well, look, early on, Egypt was early on divided into two kingdoms, but we don't even really track the first time period of ancient Egypt, well, we kind of do a little bit. We refer to it as the Archaic period, as in old or out of use, right? So when they were two kingdoms, we don't really track them as being a successful civilization yet. They became a super successful civilization, complete with a culture that went throughout their entire civilization due to one guy, and his name is King Menes, or Pharaoh Menes, because they have pharaohs that lead over their people. Pharaoh Menes of the very first dynasty, right, which we'll talk about here in a second as well, united the two kingdoms together in 3100 BC. Now, if you see BCE, it just means before common era. It's the politically correct way of saying before Christ, all right? So, well, we can just say BC here. It's not a big deal. Now, he created a one huge, large, autonomous political unit, right? When he did this, he united those two kingdoms together, and he created one Egypt that spanned the entire Nile. Now, are they going to deal with other people? Yes, they're going to deal with the Hittites at one point, and then they're going to deal with the, uh, oh, what's the, the invading, the Hyksos at one point, they're going to deal with them, uh, or the Hyksos is what they were referred to as, uh, the Nubians, uh, of course, down below them, but Egypt itself had one unified culture that spanned the Nile because King Menes united them together. And it's also hilarious, really quick, too, just a little side note, how Menes died, so funny. He apparently died while floating down the Nile on a on a boat, either by hip, like possibly by being eaten by a hippo, which is absolutely hilarious. Because uh, hippos actually kill more things in Africa than uh, all the other major predators combined. Uh, hippos are very territorial, so apparently the word on the street is the very first pharaoh of Egypt may have died from hippo attack. How awesome is that? Now, anyway, so really, really quick though, you can actually see the unification process of Upper and Lower Egypt that Menes completed, again, Menes, completed in the crowns that pharaohs would wear, right? The crowns pharaohs would wear were actually a combined symbol of the Upper and Lower Kingdom of Egypt, right? Upper as in being further up the Nile on what you is actually, on directionally speaking, the southern half. Uh, but anyway, the Upper Kingdom crown was a white, this goofy looking thing that looks almost like a bowling ball pen, right? So, and then this thing right here, which always to me, I imagine a lizard is just living in here and just going, bail. All right, so, but that, those two crowns symbolized Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. And when Menes united them together, they actually took both crowns and mushed them together, right? Creating a symbol of the unification of Egypt. And the key thing here is, is when he did that, he successfully created a centralized government. Jot that down. A centralized government. A centralized government is a government that is ruled from one location, right? Or it has a central location of which all citizens can refer to as the base of their government, right? So the IE being like a capital city. And what is their capital? Memphis, right? Memphis being their capital where the pharaohs and the royals lived, right? So the centralized government is going to be created for the very first time in Egypt. And do we to this day use that centralized government concept that the Egyptians themselves created? Heck yeah, we do, right? We have an executive at the top who has a bureaucratic order below him, which we'll get into that later on when we talk about Sinseret, who is the guy that actually began to kind of create the bureaucratic system within ancient Egypt, right? So going forward, though, this is Mesopotamia. That is not centralized, right? So as you can understand, 
Egypt has a culture you know of, or have at least heard of, or Hollywood has heard of and has made movies about, right? You know that their writing might have been hieroglyphics, which we talk about later on in class. You know that their mummification process was a very, very intense ritual of their religion. You know some of their gods, right? You might have heard of a few of them before. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they had one cohesive culture that went throughout their entire kingdom, and that centralized government's a big deal, right? Whereas this is Mesopotamia. Here's the Tigris, there's the Euphrates right there. Look Look at all the city-states that existed within that Mesopotamia region, right? The fact that every single one of these city-states might have had their own dialect language, might have had their own simple writing style, probably usually actually existing from cuneiform coming out of Sumeria, but still, right, they might have actually had differences among them. So this, i.e., Mesopotamia is a series of city-states, whereas Egypt was not. Egypt was one unified country, one, well not country, but one unified kingdom that actually spanned the entirety of the Nile after Menes united the two of them together, right? So that is a big deal about their government. But speaking about their government, I also mentioned that Menes is of the first dynasty, right? Now what a dynasty is, or what dynastic rule is, is ruling through ruling families, right? Now we also know a couple of things about the Egyptian ruling families, okay? The dynasties, there were 30 of them in total, right? 30 dynasties in total. The most prosperous one being the 18th, the one that King Tut was a part of, or Tutankhamun, or Tutankhaten was actually his real name before he had to change it, or he actually changed it. He didn't need to change it. It's a dad thing. He had dad problems. We'll talk about it later. All right, now, anyway, so, but the following thing uh, to understand is that these, or what these dynasties are. What they are is hereditary ruling, okay? So dynasties are a ruling family. Okay? As in the father of the family is the pharaoh, and then his son will his eldest son will take over and become the next pharaoh, and usually they will be naming each other after their father, right? So they, that's why we had several Ramses and we had several uh, uh, several Ptolemies, right? Ptolemies, uh, spelled P-T-O-L-E-M-Y, right? We had several of them as well, okay? So this dynastic rule though is a ruling family. Okay? And when that family would die out, another dynasty would be stepped in and would actually take over. Okay? So we'll talk about Mott later on when it comes to rebellions and stuff like that. But anyway, so this differs a lot from Mesopotamia. This dynastic rule, of course, in the centralized government being ruled from that one location by this one family that had a bureaucratic system underneath them all the same, but we'll talk about that later on. This differs from Mesopotamia because Mesopotamia was led by people like Nebuchadnezzar or people like King Hammurabi. And those guys are military leaders. The only reason anybody ever could keep control or actually grow their power in Mesopotamia is mainly due to the fact that they had a military structure and they were warlords, right? So that's a big, big difference. Nebuchadnezzar and Hammurabi are warlords. They are not dynastic rulers, right? So going forward some more, though. So we've been talking all about their government. We know they're a dynastic ruling. We know that they're centralized. We talked about their geography being in northern Africa and actually being hot and arid and Nile being blah, blah, blah. We talked about all that stuff. We'll review it tomorrow. Let's get into the one other thing that we're going to compare them to with Mesopotamia real quick, their religion and mythology. Now, this is the other cool part. Remember we talked about Mesopotamia today? Uh, like 3,600 gods. That is aggressive. All right, like Enlil being one of them. Enkidu actually being like this other really cool story when we talked about Gilgamesh. Um, Enlil, Ishtar, right? Ishtar actually being a really, really famous one as well. There's a stupid myth about how Easter is named after it. That's not true. Uh, anyway, but getting after it, we know a lot more and a lot more uniformity when it comes to Egyptian mythology than we do about Mesopotamian mythology and religion mainly due to the fact that they, again, were a centralized, unified, one singular kingdom, so they had a similar religious structure that spanned the entire thing, right? So it was much more efficient and made much more sense. So, early on in their religious structure, they believed in two supreme gods. Two supreme gods. One named Amun, who was the wise king god of the sky, right? And Ra being the justified taker of life, or as a IE symbolized in the sun, right? Now, why would they do this, right? Remember, they're a desert-like climate, right? So they believe the sun to be the thing that creates crop growth and also can be the thing that takes life, right? Aha. And the unification of the sun and the sky because they are, are in one entity together, yeah? Okay, so that, of course, is connected to their environment. We'll talk about environmental connections as well with their mythology here in about two seconds. But Horus was one of their... Demigods, jot this down. Uh, the Mes or not Mesopotamian, the Egyptian 
Religion does believe in demigod structure. Demigods are lesser gods, smaller gods, little guys, right? Ones that aren't necessarily as big or as powerful as their supreme gods. But the very first demigod to actually show up was a dude named Horus, right? Horus, the falcon god of the hunt and war, right? And he is also the messenger of Ra. Why would Horus be the messenger of Ra? Because he's a bird, right? He's a falcon, being able to fly over very, very long distances, okay? Again, environmental connection, right? And it is believed that he carried with him the ruling power to be bestowed upon pharaohs, right? So he was an important demigod to them, okay? And then going forward, you're going to see a lot of other demigods pop up, but not until after you start seeing a unification of their religion. Now, later on, or not Mesopotamia, why do I keep doing that? Egyptian priests are going to actually combine Amun and Ra together to create their one supreme god. Very, very interesting, right? Oh, oh okay, let's back it up a little bit. Amun Ra, all right? Amun Ra becomes their supreme god, okay? So, ironically enough, when we see this, we see yet another parallel, right? We're seeing a parallel between the Hebrew people, which we will talk about later, but you know them as being the Judaic people, or the Jewish faith, right? Having one supreme god that they believe in named Yahweh, right? The, the Egyptians who are believed to have had some type of contact with these early Aramaic Judaic Jewish people also had a supreme god as well named Amun Ra, right? Now they did though, however, have a polytheistic structure beneath it, okay? So Amun Ra was their supreme god, right? He is actually completely formless and he is believed to be able to embody himself in anything at any time. I'm sorry, there's like one of my wife's hairs is on me somewhere and it's like, women just, y'all shed like wildebeest. All right, uh, got it. All right, so anyway, getting back to it, right? So Amun Ra was their one unified God construct, right? And it is believed that he was omnipresent. See, can embody himself as anything at any time, as it could be anywhere at any moment. And they also believed that he was all seeing, um, the omniscience, there we go, all seeing, all knowing, right? Can see everything at once. And you would see him represented in two different fashions, right? Sometimes represented right here as the all seeing eye of Ra. You see him like these symbols used a lot in religious manuscripts, particularly this thing called the Book of the Dead, which we'll talk about here in about two seconds. And then you would also see him sometimes apparently embodied in demigod form, right? So here is Horus again. Whenever you would see this red circle above his head, that means that Amun Ra was present in his form. Very cool stuff, right? So their religions are going to change a little bit, but they are still going to retain a lot of these demigods. But it will go Amun Ra at the very top and then the demigods beneath them. And the demigods had all these really interesting kind of Greek, borderline, vengeful, spiteful, like arguments between the two of them. And the biggest one that I like to talk about is, of course, the story of Osiris, all right? So Osiris is another one of their demigods as well, okay? To give you a little bit of, like, keying in on just, like, some cool little, uh... Uh, Egyptian mythology, right? So Osiris was their god, uh, one of their demigods of the Nile and fertility, right? So uh, the story goes, the Osiris story goes, you do not need to write this down, just kind of check in and listen a little bit right here. Os the Osiris story goes, apparently, that Osiris himself was once a human king, right? Was once a human pharaoh in and of himself and was the god of the Nile eventually, right? So, but he was a king all the same, was in human form. And he had a brother that was actually more demigod-like, and his name was Set, all right? S-E-T, Set. And Set is considered to be kind of this, like, mischievous god, a little bit villainous, kind of like Loki in, like, the, uh, the Marvel movies, right? So Set was very, very jealous of Osiris because he was, like, growing in power and growing in fame and growing in appreciation. And Set got so mad at him that he struck out because they were brothers and he was furious about this. He sets out to kill his brother, right? Aha! We got another, like, little bit of parallel right there. The vengeful, like, what's it called? Fratern like, frat fratricide? Fratricide. Killing of the brother, right? So, Set then decides, he's like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna build a big sarcophagus. And what a sarcophagus is, is the thing that bodies are buried inside of in ancient Egypt. We'll talk about that a little bit later on as well when we get into their technology and stuff. Now, sarcophagi, or sarcophagus, are these big coffins that they would bury their mummified bodies inside of. And so Set apparently had one design that would perfectly fit Osiris. And at a party, he shows it to him. He's like, look, brother, I got you a gift. Check out this sarcophagus. And he opens it up, and he tells Osiris to hop in there so he can make sure it fits, right? And Osiris does this willingly because he has no reason to not trust him. And then Set slams the thing, sh the sh slams the thing shut, and then... Set chops it up into a bunch of little pieces and then hucks all the pieces in the Nile, right? He's like, 
take that. What's up? But then you have to understand Isis, all right, the wise wife of Osiris, who also was a great representation of how women had more power in ancient Egypt, which is super interesting. We'll get to that later. There were actually queen rulers, female pharaohs of uh, Egypt, and Isis is a good representation of that. They did not actually look down on women of, as harshly in Egypt as they did in other ancient civilizations. But Isis was Osiris' wife, who apparently went to the Nile and fished out all the little bits and pieces of Osiris and then pieced them back together. And when she did that, he was completely resurrected, right? He was resurrected and he then became the person that would judge every soul, right? He became the god of the Nile and fertility and his wife Isis became the goddess of the Nile and the resurrection, right? So she is believed to bring Osiris back to life every single September when the river would flood, all right? So like that is supposed to be the connection. That is their story to try and explain how the connection between the river and resurrection of life, okay, like Osiris connects to their crop yields, right? Another little environmental factor right there. The other really, really neat part about it is later on, Osiris also becomes the judgment of souls, and we'll get to that tomorrow, okay? So, but going forward a little bit more, so Osiris is another one of their famous gods, right? Set, of course, the big, big, mean one. And then also, wait, ooh, ooh, ooh. There we go. All right, so, which is, of course, if I just said Osiris is also the judger of souls, that means for a second that Egyptians must believe in an afterlife, all right? So Egyptians did believe in a very sophisticated concept of an afterlife. They did believe that a plane existed for people to live on post-death, all right? So Egyptians and their afterlife has to do a lot with a couple of other gods, right? We're going to tell the whole story of the judgment tomorrow, which is a lot of fun to talk about, but Anubis is their big god when it comes to being the angel of death. All right, so another little environmental connection. Anubis is one of my, is probably my favorite Egyptian god. He's very, very tall, and he's apparently very muscular, and he's a big guy who has a jackal for a head. What a jackal is is like a coyote. It's kind of like a wolf, right? But here's the cool thing, environmental factor, right? Jackals are the scavengers, or one of the scavengers of dead animals and carcass in the desert, right? There's your environmental connection. Why would a jackal be the angel of death? Because what do jackals do? They eat the dead, right? So of course, Anubis, their angel of death, death, their usher of the dead, is apparently the guy that would come to get you and walk you into the underworld to have your soul judged by Osiris himself and his wife Isis right behind him, right? Now, all of these ideas are actually outlined in their, their, their ideas about afterlife are outlined in a text that we have actually had access to, and we still have access to, known as the Book of the Dead, right? And what we're gonna do tomorrow is we're gonna talk about how these guys, mummified bodies, actually relate to their judgment story and how it all relates to their concept of the afterlife, all right? So I will see you guys then. I am really enjoying this class. I'm absolutely loving it, but I'll talk to y'all soon. Y'all have a good one.